I'm Alice. I am a site reliability engineer with far too much free time, as you will soon see. A site reliability engineer is just a fancy way of saying that I'm a professional worrier with pseudo access. Uh, some people also say sysadmin at scale. Any buzzword you want to put and then at scale will probably also describe me. But before I was an SRE, I was in ops. What do you know? And before that, I was a software engineer. Before that, I was in tech support. And before that, I was in film. Obviously. I have a degree in film and animation. And when I graduated, all of my peers started living in their cars. And I went, ah. And then I went into tech. So you can say that I traded apple boxes for pizza boxes. No one found that <laughs> funny. Someone out there is laughing, I promise. So despite having no formal education or training in the fine science of computer arts, people still look to me for advice. They invite me to these conferences to give talks. They even pay me money to be an engineer. And I think that's just a really great indication that there are many ways to get into ops, many fine, twisting, arcane paths. So I'd like to ask you some questions. Raise your hand if you got into operations because you have a CS degree. OK, good. Raise your hand if you got into operations because you don't have a CS degree, but you went to school and maybe you got started as like a university sysadmin. OK, good. And raise your hand if you got into ops because you just decided to mess around with shit on your own free time. OK, there we go. Yep. People don't usually get into ops on purpose. <laughs> usually they were going somewhere else, and then they fell through a hole in the ground, and they were like, well, this is my life now. <laughs> hmm. And it's a lot less clear than it is for, say, someone like a developer. If someone wants to be a developer, there are very defined paths that we know that person will take. They can go to school and get a CS degree. They can go to a boot camp, learn JavaScript in 10 weeks, and then God help us all. <laughs> or they can self-educate with online courses such as Code Academy or Treehouse or just books that other people have written. Very well-defined paths to success. But if someone wants to go into ops, they just have snakes. Just, just a pile of snakes. And somewhere in those snakes are Linux and hardware and Amazon. If they try to reach in to touch any of it, they get bitten. And then they're just like, whatever. And they climb out of the hole and they go on their merry way. And we never get to meet them. So how can we make this better? How can we get someone who is interested in ops to actually get into ops and make it as easy for them as it is for someone who wants to be a developer? And furthermore, why? Why should we help these people? Why should we care? I mean, we got jobs. We're self-sufficient. We have job security. Those new people are just going to come in and take our jobs with their all non-broken spirits. <laughs> They're going to be like, on call, that sounds cool, and then you'll just be gone. And what were you going to do about that? It's a few reasons why we should be finding new people to bring into ops. First of all, yes, your ops skills and knowledge is a precious jewel. And it wasn't just handed to you. It was something that you worked hard for, that you dug for. But you didn't do it alone. You didn't just like sit and meditate in a data center until you understood ZFS. No one understands ZFS. Someone taught you that, or you read a book by someone. You weren't in a vacuum. And so you really owe it to the community to give that knowledge back to them. Plus, learning with someone else is the best way to solidify your knowledge. Teaching someone will really teach you what you actually know, so you really get a lot out of it. But the most important reason why we should be bringing new people into ops is because these were legitimate hashtags in 2016. People think they don't need ops, and that the ops mentality is an old way of living. And maybe we're OK with that. Maybe you're like, I'm at the end of my career. I know what I'm doing. It's fine. But I don't know about you, but I mean, 
My bank is software now. Uh, my health insurance is software now. I can even buy groceries using software. And I kind of want good ops people working behind the scenes there. And the only way we're going to make sure good ops people are keeping our apps up and our software working and our world running is if we make sure they have the knowledge to do so and to succeed. So how can we do this? Well, today we're going to talk about three major things. We're going to figure out what we want to say. We're going to take stock of our legacy, as it were. We're going to identify people to say it to. We're going to be like, you, you're, you're with me now. And they're going to cry, but they're going to like it. And then we're going to figure out how to actually say these things to them, how to deliver this knowledge to these people. So let's dig in with what should we teach. I was trying to figure out, OK, so what does it mean to be in ops? And I, I boiled it down to two things, tools and culture. So let's start with tools. I think that's pretty obvious. I and mean, if you want to get into ops, you start with hardware. Get into the guts of the machine. Know what a stick of RAM looks like and how to replace one. But on the other hand, I mean, everything this day is like in the cloud. So maybe, maybe you should learn Amazon first. AWS, that's the ticket. Don't do, don't do hardware. Hardware is old. Get an AWS and then also maybe Azure. I don't know what that is, but you should learn it. And, and, but, but then again, then again, then again, today infrastructure is code. So you got to start here. Get on that now. You will never succeed if you don't know how to manage your own memory. Just get on that. And then after that, I mean, geez, there's configuration management, there's, there's GCE, there's Jenkins, which is like this butler that just yells at me if I do something wrong. I mean, there's, there's just a, a rich tapestry of tools. But let me tell you something. Your tools don't matter. Think back to the first operations job you had, first sysadmin job you had, and the tools that you use every day. How many of those are you still using? When was the last time you wrote a batch job? If it was yesterday, I'm sorry. But <laughs> you're probably not using the same exact tool set because tools change and needs change. And you don't need to teach everything you know now to new people. What I want you to do is think about what are the bare minimum tools and skills someone would need to do your job right now? So for me, that would be Python and some Linux. If someone can write some Python scripts or maybe even a web app and navigate a Linux system and do some basic troubleshooting, they can grip the edge of my job and pull themselves up and figure out what they're doing. That's it. That's all they need. And I understand you want to give people a full toolbox. You want to open it up and have all these trays that are layered and, and, and have your opinions on them, like never this, but maybe sometimes this, and oh, this is Ruby, and just like a whole bunch of things. And you want to give them everything you know. You just want to shove that into their head. But at the end of the day, what you're going to be giving people is a hammer. Just a hammer. And yeah, sure, one day a tree is going to need to come down, and they're just going to wham on it with the hammer. If you teach them bash and cron jobs, and then someone's like, we need a monitoring system, they're going to be like, I know what to do. <laughs> I got this. Every second, I'll just run this cron job. And you, I mean, you have to SSH in the box to see it and like be in the right session. But it'll be fine. It'll be fine. This is the way to do it. And they're going to stumble. And they're going to walk around with that hammer in those woods and try to fell those trees. But eventually, they're going to pick up a screwdriver or a wrench or Ruby. And they're going to be like, this looks dumb, but they'll keep it. And eventually they'll be able to compare it to that hammer they know so well, and then they will build their own toolkit. And you will help them by giving them a frame of reference to start with that hammer. So let's move on to culture. Ops has a bit of a known culture. It's usually this. We're known for saying stop. We're known for saying no. We're known for saying hell no. We're known for being that stop energy in the room that keeps change from happening. And I don't really want to pass that on. Now, don't get me, don't get me confused, OK? Please keep the gallows humor. Like, I am all about the gallows humor. We will play hangman while the data center burns all the day. Please, please keep doing that. What I'm talking about is the boff, that bastard operator from hell. That is something that people do when they feel invalidated, when they feel petty, when they feel childish. 
And I don't want that to be the legacy that we pass on to the new generation. Now, okay, let, let me tell you something, all right? I and my Twitter account are very aware of the different ideologies between dev and ops. <laughs> I get it. I get where the boff is coming from. But it really doesn't do you any favors. You think you're making devs lives worse and that makes yours better. You're actually making your life worse as well because now people don't want to work with you. They don't want to help you and you will be the one that stagnates, not them. And help is around the corner. Things like the DevOps movement, they are changing things at the right companies. DevOps Days is a conference that I help run. I find it very fulfilling. And that new culture of breaking down barriers and breaking down the wall really takes off some of the historical burden on ops. So please hang in there. Please don't become cynical and crusty. Just become darkly, darkly humorous. But, but also be kind. So when it comes down to actual ops culture, I boiled it down to three main things. Be curious. Encourage people to question their surroundings and their systems. Teach them to ask things like, what's this log message mean? How does this protocol work? What is this user and what are they doing on my system? Anyone here read the cuckoo's egg? Yep, yep. The curious people are the best troubleshooters. They're the ones that want to take everything apart and then they learn more as they do it. So encourage curiosity. Pass that on as a cultural attribute. Also, teach people to build strong systems, AKA cover your own ass. Build defensively, build systems that are strong, that can't be taken down. Teach people to think of things such as, what if we need to fail over the database? What if this cron job that you just taught me about and I will use for everything fails? What if we get a spike in traffic? Do we have enough overhead? Have we provisioned enough? Even if you're only managing a few servers, teaching these good habits will help people scale, both themselves and their systems. And they might move from a small pond to the big ocean, but if they have those habits in mind of how to treat systems and how to build them well, those skills will take them far in their career. Last but not least, serve your users. I know, I know, maybe a little, maybe a little boff cringe there, but it is your job to make sure that your users have the best experience on your systems possible. It is your job, you have that power, and you should make it so that they can use it without friction. Do things such as keep things patched. Work with developers on their roadmap goals so they can ship in time. Build automated infrastructure to take yourself out of the equation so no one ever has to talk to you and you can do things you actually want to do. And last but not least, Protect them from themselves. Now you might think like, ah yes, I knew it. I knew she would say no, I knew it. I'm not talking about a stop sign. I'm talking about a life preserver. Keep them afloat when they might be drowning and they don't even know they're drowning. I got this idea from Kasky. I don't know if he's in the room, but big shout out to Kasky. This idea of turning a no because into a yes but. So traditionally someone comes to you and they're just like, you know what's cool? Elastic search. And, and you're just like, absolutely not, no, because we use real databases here. And, and you want to say something like that, right? But what we want to do is turn that into a yes, but please understand the operational load this may put on your team and ours. Yes, but make sure you understand how to scale a property. Yes, but make sure that you can have the proper infrastructure in place to support it. Work with them on it. Don't be that roadblock because they will figure out how to go around you anyway. And then you'll get paged for US East 1 dash Elasticsearch dash lol dash 1. And you'll be like, God damn it, okay? If you just work with them and make sure things work for you and your infrastructure, then everything is going to be okay. Because what we are really passing on to this next generation of ops professionals is a golden key. They're gonna need all the keys to the kingdom. They're gonna get root. It's gonna be terrifying. We wanna make sure they handle that responsibility well. Many developers already see us as witches. We should make sure that we are good ones. So for culture, teach people to be curious, teach them to build strong systems, and teach them to serve their users. And if you do that, you're gonna be giving them a compass. Just a compass, not even a map. But if they find themselves in a strange location or uncharted territory, they can refer back to those values and, and find their way out of the woods. 
if they find themselves thinking like, huh, I, I don't know, a, a user says that they want to do something, but I think it's dumb and I'm tired, think back. Maybe they can schedule a meeting tomorrow when they're not tired and work with the user on that. Really try to instill these values and people will take it and run with it. And you're giving them the compass and the hammer. They're basically just going to tape the compass to the hammer. It's going to be like when you ask for the bathroom key at Starbucks. And they're going to around in the woods with their compass hammer trying to fell down trees, but they won't get lost and eventually they'll find other tools and it's going to be okay. Just give them these guide points to move on. So we've discussed what we should be handing on. Let's talk about the kind of people we want to be handing it on to. There are many success stories in the ops space and no two paths are the same. There are plenty of brilliant people from non-traditional backgrounds that you never would have guessed would make it in the ops space, but they did. I want to highlight some of those people. For example, Dana Lawson. Dana has a fine arts degree, and when she graduated, she joined the Army, which then promptly stationed her in Arizona. And the only air-conditioned room at her Arizona base was the server room. So Dana became a sysadmin. And Dana eventually worked in the United States Army NOC. And Dana is now the VP of Platform Engineering at Envision. That's where Dana came from. There's also Kelsey Hightower. Some of you may, may know Kelsey already. Kelsey doesn't have a college degree. He got into repairing computers when he was in high school with books he got from Barnes & Noble. Started his own computer repair shop as a teenager. Eventually went on to work in data centers, be an IT tech, and work for companies like Puppet, CoreOS, and he's now the public face of Google's Kubernetes project. There's also Charity Majors. Charity's an art school dropout who started hanging out in her computer lab because she liked the people there. She got into infrastructure, went on to work for companies such as Parse and Facebook, now owns her own company, Honeycomb. You never would have guessed, looking at these people and where they started, that they would end up where they are today. And it's difficult. You want to find these other success stories, but, but how can you when they seem so varied and weird and completely out of the blue? Well, there are some places that we can start. Support. If you work for a company whose product is tech or a SaaS software solution or something like that, you probably have a support department supporting it. And that is a great place to look for new ops talent. They're excellent troubleshooters. I mean, they have to be. They're dealing with customer issues all the time. They're fast learners because they're always trying to figure out the new features in the product. You only have to push out a new feature. They have to support all of them. They're also familiar with a bunch of different systems because the users are always writing in about their weird random Raspberry Pi Arduino nonsense. They have to know an entire landscape of tech, which makes them perfect to come into ops. So I would recommend taking a look at your support department if you're looking for someone to mentor. There's also boot camp developers. This might seem counterintuitive, but it can actually work out pretty well. Boot camp devs already know the basics. They already understand what a computer box is. They understand that there's code inside it, and they've written some of the code. And what they usually don't understand is that next step, getting it into production. And many of them are fascinated by that. So while you're teaching them about ops, they can also teach you how to code better, maybe even make some tooling for you. It could be a mutually beneficial relationship. But even if it doesn't work out, the worst case scenario is to have a more empathetic dev. And we need all the help we can get. So again, boot camp devs, excellent place to mentor in ops. There's also IT. How many of you have an IT background? OK, good. IT is great. IT is a perfect place to go to get someone into ops. I mean, it makes sense. They have the same user issues, the same system issues. They pr probably also use a ticketing system. In fact, they are almost too good. And I don't really want to scare anyone off or offend anyone by saying this, but because IT has such a similar environment to ops, you can get that boff in an IT person. And so definitely mentor IT people, bring them into the ops space, but be aware that they might already be bringing chips in on their shoulders and that, that cynical culture. And just keep an eye out for that and help, help them help their users and help them help their systems be better instead. But what if you don't have support people or IT or boot camp devs to talk to you? I would encourage you to look farther using those cultural values we already talked about. 
finding people who are curious, who can build strong systems and serve your users. So for example, if you want to find people who are curious, look for tinkerers. Look for people who like to build things and mess around with them. And you might think of someone who like messes around with cars or took the microwave apart and put it back together and it doesn't work anymore, but they got gumption. There's, there's kind of that stereotype of ops people being grease monkeys. But it doesn't have to be someone who tinkers with their hands. It can be someone who likes puzzles, or games, or murder mysteries, or anything that really stokes their sense of wonder and curiosity where they're trying to figure out who done it. Or just someone who is always asking you questions about your job. What are you doing? What is a server? Can I come see? They might be annoying, but it means that they're curious. They want to know what you're doing. That's an ample opportunity to pick them up and teach them something. Now, if you want somebody who's going to build strong systems, look for people who are organized, who have their life together, even if it's to a little bit of, of a weird extent where they have spreadsheets for everything. And you also want them to be a little bit paranoid. So like, if you don't text someone back after a few hours and they think you died, that's a good place to start. It's <laughs> a good place to start. Good SRE material there. They're going to bring that same worry and concern and, and fastidiousness to your systems. They're going to be ones coming up with the checklist upon checklist to make sure that you have a backup monitoring system, that you have a run book in place, that you know what you're going to do at 3 a.m. And those are excellent people to have in ops. Oh, and by the way, the things that they might care about might not be important to you, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't care about them. So if someone has like a spreadsheet or a binder of their favorite lipstick colors and when they're going to go on sale, heck, that's perfect. Not only are they color coordinated, but they care about deals. That person is going to rack and organize cables like you wouldn't believe. Definitely bring them on. Now for people who can serve their users, look for people who have service-oriented backgrounds, who work retail or have a marketing degree. These people have amazing skills, born through fire. They know when people get cranky how to talk to them. They're used to users that don't behave. They're used to bad actors. They're used to people trying to shoplift. They're used to long hours. They understand that grind. They have a good mentality, and they're used to understanding what's on the other side of the table and bringing that to that person. They know people, and they know how terrible people can be. When it comes to ops and hiring and mentors, there's a lot of emphasis on technical systems. But there should be at least equal amount of emphasis on systems of communication. Spoiler alert, tech is easy. It is. Tech is easy. Anyone can learn tech. You know what's difficult? Walking into a meeting and telling someone no and not getting fired. That's hard. Negotiating is hard. Dealing with users is hard. Politics are hard. And people that have retail experience and marketing experience are much better at it than, frankly, me. Speaking of marketing degrees, I want to tell you about Carol. Carol has a marketing degree. After her marketing degree, she went to a boot camp and learned Ruby. And then she got a tech support job where I met her. She was doing tickets all day and troubleshooting customer systems, but she wanted to do more. So I brought her to the site engineering team at my company, where she was doing tickets for RMAs. Eventually, she went and racked servers. Now she's writing tooling to provision those same servers. Again, retail background. Just got to look for those right people. I also want to tell you about Nuala. Nuala has an anthropology degree. She then became a kindergarten teacher in Russia. After a few years, she felt like a change. So she came back to the US and took an assistance job at a tech company where her job was to welcome guests and provision computers for new employees. And at one point, she told the director of systems engineering that she really liked provisioning computers, because sometimes something wouldn't work right. And then she got to figure out what happened. He took that and ran with it, gave her sysadmin tasks, uh, taught her things. And now she is finishing up a year as an ops engineer at Etsy. These people are out there. They want to learn. They want to learn ops. You just have to know where to look for them. So we discussed what we want to teach and who we want to teach. Now we're going to discuss how we should teach. I mean, we have the compass hammer. 
We're wandering through the woods. We found the person, and now we have to give it to them. There's a few ways to do this. I've broken them down to the concepts of one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many, -many, because yes, I am technical. So one-to-one -one is the most intense relationship, so we're going to start there with apprentice, apprenticeships, taking someone on full-time, having them work with you and by your side and really learning your craft. This really levels up people fast. It's not something everyone can do. This is something that maybe like a, a contractor or a consultant would have an easier time doing. But really pouring yourself into this other person and showing them the ropes and being there for them, uh, it builds such strong people as they get into ops. It's a really great educational experience. So you have the bandwidth, I would recommend doing that. A more popular format is to take on a mentee. So if you were climbing a mountain and you had an apprentice, you would be climbing right next to them and showing them where all the good handholds were and catching them when they fall. If you have a mentee, it's more like someone wants to climb a mountain and you're their safety rope. You're their safety line is going to keep them from falling when they slip. It's a lot less of an intense relationship, but it's an excellent relationship nonetheless. If you have a mentee, you're probably meeting with them maybe an hour, once a week, or every two weeks. They came to you or you came to them, and they're going to say something like, uh, I, I don't know, should I learn Ruby? Or, you know, like, what's up with Cassandra? Or I don't understand the difference, like, what is Gen 2? And that's when you could teach them those, those things that they're asking about to get them over that hump and then send them on their way. It's a great relationship to have. You feel good because you're imparting knowledge. They feel good because they're learning on their own, and that helps them learn better. It's not a ton of time, but it's a very lucrative way. It's a very successful way to teach people. And by the way, I want to stop here and tell you that it's OK if you don't know things. It's OK as a mentor and as, as someone with an apprentice. It's OK if you don't know the answer to things. Because not only are you human, but so were they. And something they're probably really worried about is not knowing something and being embarrassed about it. And if your answer is, ah, let's check Google, that's great. That's great because that's what they do anyway. They just don't want you to know about it. <laughs> that's what I do anyway, and I don't want you to know about it. That's what people at Google do anyway. Hmm. <laughs> now they check Stack Overflow. But anyway, <laughs> so. Telling people you don't know things is perfectly fine and OK, and it'll actually boost their confidence along the way. So don't, don't be afraid to be a mentor. There's also the intern model, which a lot of companies are doing these days. And that is still a one-to-one -one relationship. It's just a much narrower field, because usually your team has an intern, or maybe your department has an intern. And they're spending time with each one of the people on that team an equal amount of time. That's really great, because that means that the puppet person will teach them puppet things, and the networking person will teach them networking things. And so the people teaching feel confident and like an expert in that one subject that they're bestowing upon the intern, and the intern is getting the best that they can get from everyone. This is a really good payoff, and it usually leads to hiring that intern. But even if it doesn't, you're going to help them, uh, get, set them up for success no matter what. So intern is also a good way to bring someone on. As for one-to-many, you can give a talk. Huh. Apply to the CFP at conferences or local meetups. You might think, I don't really want to get on a stage and be recorded. That's terrifying. Well, reach out to local meetups. There are a ton of them out there. And a lot of them are code-focused. You might say to yourself, I, I have nothing that I could teach people. But again, similar to boot camp devs, these meetups focus a lot on coding and how to get started. They will have workshops where they make blogs or apps, and then after spending eight hours with their database, the last step is usually, if have time, push to Heroku. And that's it. And so a lot of people that attend these meetups to learn about tech and learn about programming don't know those next steps and can be fascinated by them. So I would recommend reaching out to the organizers of these meetups. Don't just show up, but reach out to the organizers and say, hey, I have a background in ops. Would uh, the people that come to your meetup be interested in seeing what a server looks like, or learning about Puppet, or, or AWS? And so many times they will say yes, and they will want you to bring that skill set to them. 
and you'll be filling in a big void for people and possibly even get some of them interested in going ops instead. Last but not least, many-to-many -many relationships. Write docs. Come on. How many of you have a project you wish more people used? Yep. How many of you have a project that you want to use, but the docs suck? Yeah. No one's going to use anything without proper documentation. Proper documentation includes examples. I don't want paragraphs about the theory behind why your shit works. I want curl commands that I can immediately pipe into root, okay? That is what I want. <laughs> and if you don't give me that, I'm going to go somewhere else. So write docs. Even if you're a user of someone else's project and you decided, okay, the docs suck, but I'm going to try anyway. Come over on a weird edge case. You figure out how to get around it. Put in a PR to include that example in the docs. Help someone out in the future. At this point, I really want to plug a project called Ops School. Some of you might already know about it. Yeah. Ops School, go to opschool.org. It is a currently maintained open source project that you could contrib contribute to on GitHub. And it's basically everything that you would want to tell someone, like that toolbox we talked about that I told you was bad, but is good in this one scenario. It goes through sysadmin 101, networking, Linux, config management, basic programming. And it's all right there. It's something that I really like to point people to when they ask me where they should start learning about ops. But the thing is, it's incomplete. There's lots of to-dos. Even just paragraphs, like, please explain this one concept. To-do, do it later. You could be that to-doer. <laughs> you could do that today, during your lunch break or during this afternoon when you're bored or burned out. Go check out Ops School and what the patches are, what needs to be fixed, and put in a PR. I promise you, you can contribute something. And this is a great way to help contribute to our ongoing Ops legacy and have a good starting point for new people looking to learn. And if you feel like you can't contribute anything there, possibly start a blog or get a Twitter. Even just one small info bit a day, you know, like, hey, Cassandra 3.7, hints are different, look out. That builds up over a long period of time, and it helps people. And if you don't feel like you can maintain a blog or keep up with a Twitter, then share them. Share interesting posts, tweets, books. You don't have to be creepy about it, but if you hear someone say, hey, I don't know what this is, it sounds interesting, or like, what are you doing over there, or what is a gnat? It's, it's totally fine to say, hey, it sounds like you're interested in this. Here's a post to get you started. Let me know if you have any questions. That's it. Share someone else's work with them. Because someone out there is trying to learn right now. Someone in the future is watching this talk, I hope I still look fabulous, and I may not know the impact that I have upon them, and you might not know your greater impact, but I promise you, you will have impact if you put yourself out there and you share things and you contribute. So today we talked about how to get new people into ops. We covered three main things. What should we teach? We started with tools and culture. Basically, keep it simple. Give people the bare necessities they need to do your job so they have a toehold, so they have a way to start. And as for culture, Teach people to be curious, build strong systems, and serve their users. And together, that's really going to give them a foothold and, and, a, and a place of reference so they can go out into the world and figure things out for their own. We talked about who should we teach. Looking in places like support and boot camps and IT, because these are great places to start. But if you don't have that or you want to look further, finding people that exercise those cultural values we talked about, tinkering with things, or being organized and afraid, or being service-oriented, and having a marketing background. These are great places to start to bring someone into ops. And we also talked about how we should teach them and get the word out. Whether it's an intense one-to-one -one relationship of taking on an apprentice, or putting yourself out there and giving a talk, or writing docs for that project so I can curl into Root at 3 a.m. Oh, yes, all of these are great ways to get this information out there because we want people to succeed. We want getting into ops to be as easy as becoming as a developer. And we want those people to be proud that they're in operations and be proud of the community that they're a part of. Thank you very much.
I'm all fine with public humiliation. Before we go to the QA, I just want to quickly tell you that the font I used in this was uh, from creativecorp.com, is uh, a remake of the Commodore PET font. The art mm -hmm. is pretty much all in the public domain that I got at Pixabay that I then pixelized using Pixel app, except for the image of the ops engineer, which I got from the Women of Color Tech Chat. They have a fantastic website mm -hmm. of stock images of women in color doing technical things instead of just standing around in pumps with a clipboard listening to men talk. And you can totally use those images in your presentations and your blogs, and they're a really great resource. So, okay, thank you. All right, yes. Thanks, Alice, that was fabulous. Um, how do we help change HR practices so that we can actually do hiring of people who may not have 37 years of node experience? That is difficult. So how can we change hiring practices so that they are more open to bringing new people in? I would say internships are a good place to start. And usually companies have a budget for internships because unpaid internships are not the way to go. It should be a paid intern. And if you can prove someone's worth over like six months, even if it's just, hey, we gave this person all the work we didn't want to do, and look how much more productive our engineers are now. Hey, bringing them on board means we can continue to do this balance, and then you can continue teaching that person is a good way to get started. And yes, it is more difficult at the older companies where no matter what they put on that website, like must have 10 years of experience, must have a CS degree, it's difficult to break through those barriers. Another way you can do it is to go to HR and be like, hey, let me level with you. Like no one on my team would be eligible for this job. <laughs> Sometimes if you just have a frank discussion with them, they will respect that you know your industry in that particular way that better than they do, and you can work with them on job postings and making them more open to people. Good question. Next. Yes, uh, I have a number of things I want to talk about or write about or contribute, but there's this voice in the back of my head telling me that I'm secretly terrible and have nothing that I could possibly contribute that anyone wants to hear. You how, do I get, how do I get past that? You should read my Twitter, um, <laughs> which is basically just me rolling around crying like all hours of the day. So it's terrifying. And a good way to do this is to talk to your friends or your associates who are not in your field directly, whether it's in tech at all or in ops, and see how cool they think your job is. It's true. I have literally gone to dinners with people where they're just like, I don't know what the hell you do. What do you, what do you, what do you even do? You touch all of the servers? They let you do that? It really helps with the self-esteem. And another thing you can do is just write something small and give it to a small group of people and see what the reaction is before really putting yourself out there and taking those small bites with Twitter. It is a terrible voice to get past, but uh, especially if you do like a meetup where it's not recorded and it's off the record, if it sucks, no one's gonna believe them because there's no recording. And that really helps you get out there because there's gonna be that one person that really gets something out of it, I promise. So look at yourself through the eyes of someone else that doesn't have those experiences. Oh, one other thing. Pretend you're applying for a job somewhere else, redo your resume, and then go, holy shit, I do a lot of things, and realize that you actually do do a lot of things and you're impressive. All right, yep, next up. So given that so many of us don't have degrees or come through non-traditional ways, is there a value in creating traditional pathways to ops, creating the, in your talk description, you say there's no college major for ops. Should there be? Like, should there be ops classes in high school? Should there be ops classes in kindergarten? Like, is, is there a value to creating a more formalized pipeline or is it actually great that everyone who comes to our field comes from it sideways? I think a formalized pipeline is a good way to help people that possibly don't feel as competent. If they're just like, I don't think I can do ops. What if I miss something? I feel that all the time not having a CS degree. Like everyone else in the room, they all clearly have CS degrees. They all clearly know what things are that I don't. I'm just gonna sit in the back and be quiet. But if you have like, perhaps not a full degree of like formalized classes people can take, like trainings, which already exist out there, but you know, make them more available, then people might feel better. Like, okay, I took that class, I have the same bearings as everyone else. On the other hand, I wouldn't want that to be the standard. I wouldn't want that to be the new thing that is required in hiring, that you have these op certifications. I like the fact that we have such a diverse community and so many people have weird backgrounds that really helps them do things like troubleshoot and be curious. So I think, 
Yes, if only because it brings a greater light onto ops as a career path and it gives people a, a boost of confidence there, but I don't want to see it become a requirement. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be out there, I'll be around. All right. Thank you.